8. The Kingly Office. As the second person in the Holy Trinity, the Eternal Son, Christ naturally shares the dominion of God over all his creatures. His throne is established in the heavens and his kingdom ruleth over all, Psalms 103 verse 19. This kingship differs from the mediatorial kingship of Christ, which is a conferred and economical kingship, exercised by Christ, not merely in his divine nature, but as the Anthropos, the Godman. The latter is not a kingship that was Christ's by original right, but one with which he is invested. It does not pertain to a new realm, one that was not already under his control as Son of God, for such a realm can nowhere be found. It is rather, to speak in the words of Dick, his original kingship, invested with a new form, wearing a new aspect, administered for a new end. In general we may define the mediatorial kingship of Christ as his official power to rule all things in heaven and on earth, for the glory of God, and for the execution of God's. Purpose of Salvation We must distinguish, however, between a regnum gratii and a regnum potentii a. The spiritual kingship of Christ. 1. The nature of this kingship. The spiritual kingship of Christ is his royal rule over the regnum gratii, that is over his people or the church. It is a spiritual kingship, because it relates to a spiritual realm. It is the mediatorial rule as it is established in the hearts and lives of believers. Moreover, it is spiritual, because it bears directly and immediately on a spiritual end, the salvation of his people. And, finally, it is spiritual, because it is administered, not by force or external means, but by the Word and the Spirit, which is the Spirit of truth and wisdom, of justice and holiness, of grace and mercy. This kingship reveals itself in the gathering of the Church, and in its government, protection, and perfection. The Bible speaks of it in many places, such as, Psalms 2 verse 6, 45 colon 6 7. Compare to Hebrews 1 verses 8 and 9, 1 32 colon 11, Isaiah 9 verses 6 and 7, Jeremiah 23 verses 5 and 6, MIC 5 colon 2, Zechariah 6 verse 13, Luke 1 verse 33, 19 verses 27 and 38, 22 verse 29, John 18 verses 36 and 37, Acts 2 verses 30 to 36, and other places. The spiritual nature of this kingship is indicated, among others, by the fact that Christ is repeatedly called the head of the church, Ephesians 1 verse 22, 4 verse 15, 5 verse 23, Colossians 1 verse 18, 2 19. This term, as applied to Christ, is in some cases practically equivalent to, king, head in a figurative sense, one clothed with authority, as in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3, Ephesians 1 verse 22, 5 verse 23. In other cases, however, it is used in a literal and organic sense, Ephesians 4 verse 15, Colossians 1 verse 18, 2 19, and in part also Ephesians 1 verse 22. The word is never used, except it be in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3, without the implication of this. Organic conception. The two ideas are most intimately connected. It is just. Because Christ is the head of the church that he can rule it as king in an organic and spiritual way. The relation between the two may be indicated as follows, 1. The headship of Christ points to the mystical union between Christ and his body, the church, and therefore belongs to the sphere of being. His kingship, however, implies that he is clothed with authority, and belongs to the judicial sphere. 2. The headship of Christ is subservient to his kingship. The spirit which Christ, as the head of the church, imparts to it, is also the means by which he exercises his royal power in and over the church. Present-day premillenarians strongly insist that Christ is the head of the church, but as a rule deny that he is its king. This is tantamount to saying that he is not the authoritative ruler of the church, and that the officers of the church do not represent him in the government of the church. They not only refuse to admit that he is the king of the church, but deny his present kingship altogether, except, perhaps, as a kingship de. Yere, a kingship which is his by right but has not yet become effective. At the same time their practice is better than their theory, for in practical life they do, rather inconsistently, recognize the authority of Jesus Christ. 2. The kingdom over which it extends. This kingdom has the following characteristics. a. It is grounded in the work of redemption. 
The Regnum Gratii did not originate in the creative work of God but, as the name itself indicates, in His. Redeeming Grace No one is a citizen of this kingdom in virtue of his humanity. Only the redeemed have that honor and privilege. Christ paid the ransom for those that are His, and by His Spirit applies to them the merits of His perfect sacrifice. Consequently, they now belong to Him and recognize Him as their Lord and King. b. It is a spiritual kingdom. In the Old Testament dispensation this kingdom was adumbrated in the theocratic kingdom of Israel. Even in the Old Dispensation the reality of this kingdom was found only in the inner life of believers. The national kingdom of Israel, in which God was king, lawgiver, and judge, and the earthly king was only the vicegerent of Jehovah, appointed to represent the king, to carry out his will, and to execute his judgments, was only a symbol, and a shadow and type of that glorious reality, especially as it was destined to appear in the days of the New Testament. With the coming of the New Dispensation all the Old Testament shadows passed away, and among them also the theocratic kingdom. Out of the womb of Israel the spiritual reality of the kingdom came forth and assumed an existence independent of the Old Testament theocracy, hence the spiritual character of the kingdom stands forth far more clearly in the New Testament than it does in the Old. The Regnum Great The of Christ is identical with what the New Testament calls the kingdom of God or of heaven. Christ is its mediatorial king. Premillenarians mistakenly teach that the terms, Kingdom of God, and, Kingdom of Heaven, as they are used in the Gospels, refer to two different realities, namely, to the universal Kingdom of God and the future mediatorial Kingdom of Christ. It is perfectly evident, as some of their own leaders feel constrained to admit, that the two terms are used interchangeably in the Gospels. This appears from the fact that, while Matthew and Luke often report the same statements of Jesus, the former represents him as using the term, Kingdom of Heaven, and the latter substitutes for it the term, Kingdom of God, compare Matt, 13 with Mark 4, Luke 8 verses 1 to 10, and many other passages. The spiritual nature of the kingdom is brought out in several ways. Negatively, it is clearly indicated that the kingdom is not an external and natural kingdom of the Jews, Matt. 8, colon 11, 12, 21, 43, Luke 17 verse 21, John 18 verse 36. Positively, we are taught that it can be entered only by regeneration, John 3 verses 3 and 5, that it is like a seed cast into the earth, Mark 4 verses 26 to 29, like a mustard seed, Mark 4 verse 30, and like 11, Matt. 1333. It is in the hearts of people, Luke 17 verse 21, is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans 14 verse 17, and is not of this world, but a kingdom of the truth, John 18 verses 36 and 37. The citizens of the kingdom are described as the poor in spirit, the meek, the merciful, the peacemakers, the pure in heart, and those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. The spiritual nature of the kingdom should be stressed over against all those who deny the present reality of the mediatorial kingdom, of God and hold that it will take the form of a re-established theocracy at the return of Jesus Christ. In connection with the present-day tendency to regard the kingdom of God simply as a new social condition, an ethical kingdom of ends, to be established by human endeavors, such as education, legal enactments, and social reforms, it is well to bear in mind that the term, kingdom of God, is not always used in the same sense. Fundamentally, the term denotes an abstract rather than a concrete idea, namely, the rule of God established and acknowledged in the hearts of sinners. If this is clearly understood, the futility of all human efforts and of all mere externals is at once apparent. By no mere human endeavors can the rule of God be established in the heart of a single man, nor can any man be brought to a recognition of that rule. In the measure in which God establishes his rule in the hearts of sinners, he creates for himself a realm in which he rules and in which he dispenses the greatest privileges and the choicest blessings. And, again, in the proportion in which man responds to the rule of God and obeys the laws of the kingdom, a new condition of things will naturally result. In fact, if all those who are now citizens of the kingdom would actually obey its laws in every domain of life, the world would be so different that it would hardly be recognized. In view of all that has been said, it causes no surprise that the term, kingdom of God, is used in various senses in scripture, as, for instance, to denote the kingship of God or of the Messiah, Matt 
the realm over which this rule extends and the condition of things to which it gives rise, Matt, 721, 19 colon 23, 24, 8 12, the totality of the blessings and privileges that flow from the reign of God or of the Messiah, Matt, 13 44, 45, and the condition of things that marks the triumphant culmination of the reign of God in Christ, Matt, 22 colon 2 14, Luke 14 verses 16 to 24, 13 29. See, it is a kingdom that is both present and future. It is on the one hand a present, ever-developing, spiritual reality in the hearts and lives of men, and as such exercises influence in a constantly widening sphere. Jesus and the apostles clearly refer to the kingdom as already present in their time, Matt, 12 28, Luke 17 verse 21, Colossians 1 verse 13. This must be maintained over against the great majority of present-day premillenarians. On the other hand it is also a future hope, an eschatological reality, in fact, the eschatological aspect of the kingdom is the more prominent of the two, Matt, 7 colon 21, 22, 19 23, 22 colon 2, 14, 25 colon 1 13, 34, Luke 22 verses 29 and 30, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9, 15 verse 50, Galatians 5 verse 21, Ephesians 5 verse 5, Ithes 2 12, 2 Timothy 4 verse 18, Hebrews 12 verse 28, 2 Peter 1 verse 11. Essentially, the future kingdom will consist, like that of the present, in the rule of God established and acknowledged in the hearts of men. But at the glorious coming of Jesus, Christ this establishment and acknowledgement will be perfected, the hidden forces of the kingdom will stand revealed, and the spiritual rule of Christ will find its consummation in a visible and majestic reign. It is a mistake, however, to assume that the present kingdom will develop almost imperceptibly into the kingdom of the future. The Bible clearly teaches us that the future kingdom will be ushered in by great cataclysmic changes, Matt. 24 21-44, Luke 17 verses 22-37, 21 verses 5-33, 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 2 and 3, 2 Peter 3 verses 10-12. d. It is closely related to the church, though not altogether identical with it. The citizenship of the kingdom is co-extensive with the membership in the invisible church. Its field of operation, however, is wider than that of the church, since it aims at the control of life in all its manifestations. The visible church is the most important, and the only divinely instituted, external organization of the kingdom. At the same time it is also the God-given means par excellence for the extension of the kingdom of God on earth. It is well to note that the term, kingdom of God, is sometimes employed in a sense which makes it practically equivalent to the visible church, Matt 8:12. 13 colon 24 dash 30, 47 to 50. While the church and the kingdom must be distinguished, the distinction should not be sought along the lines indicated by premillennialism, which regards the kingdom as essentially a kingdom of Israel, and the church as the body of Christ, gathered in the present dispensation out of Jews and Gentiles. Israel was the church of the Old Testament and in its spiritual essence constitutes a unity with the Church of the New Testament, Acts 7 verse 38, Romans 11 verses 11 to 24, Gal. 3 colon 7 dash 9, 29, F. 2 colon 11 dash 22. 3. The duration of this kingship. A. Its beginning. Opinions differ on this point. Consistent premillenarians deny the present mediatorial kingship of Christ and believe that he will not be seated upon the throne as mediator until he ushers in the millennium at the time of his second advent, and the Socinians claim that Christ was neither priest nor king before his ascension. The generally accepted position of the church is that Christ received his appointment as mediatorial king in the depths of eternity, and that he began to function as such immediately after the fall, Proverbs 8 verse 23, Psalms 2 verse 6. During the old dispensation he carried on his work as king partly through the judges of Israel, and partly through the typical kings. But though he was permitted to rule as mediator even before his incarnation, he did not publicly and formally assume his throne and inaugurate his spiritual kingdom, until the time of his ascension and elevation at the right hand of God, Acts 2 verses 29-36, Phil 2 colon 5-11. B. It's Termination the prevailing opinion is that the spiritual kingship of Christ over his church will, as to its essential character, 
continue eternally, though it will undergo important changes in its mode of operation at the consummation of the world. The eternal duration of the spiritual kingship of Christ would seem to be explicitly taught in the following passages. Psalms 45 verse 6, Comp Hebrews 1 verse 8, 72 to 17, 89 to 36, 37. Isaiah 9 verse 7, Dan 2 44, 2 Samuel 7 verses 13 and 16, Luke 1 verse 33, 2 Peter 1 verse 11. The Heidelberg Catechism also speaks of Christ as our eternal King. Similarly, the Belgic Confession in Article XXVII. Moreover, the kingship and the headship of Christ are inextricably bound up together. The latter is subservient to the former, and is sometimes clearly represented as including the former, f. 1 colon 21, 22, 5 colon 22 dash 24. But, surely, Christ will never cease to be the head of his church, leaving the church as a body without a head. Finally, the fact that Christ is a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek, would also seem to argue in favor of the eternal duration of the spiritual kingship of Christ, since his mediatorial office is after all a unit. Dick and Kuiper, however, argue that this kingship of Christ will cease when he has accomplished the salvation of his people. The only passage of scripture to which they appeal is 1 Corinthians 15 verses 24 to 28, but this passage evidently does not refer to Christ's spiritual kingship, but to his kingship over the universe. b. The kingship of Christ over the universe. 1. The nature of this kingship. By the regnum potentii we mean the dominion of the Godman, Jesus Christ, over the universe his providential and judicial administration of all things in the interest of the Church. As King of the universe the Mediator so guides the destinies of individuals, of social groups, and of nations, as to promote the growth, the gradual purification, and the final perfection of the people which he has redeemed by his blood. In that capacity he also protects his own against the dangers to which they are exposed in the world, and vindicates his righteousness by the subjection and destruction of all his enemies. In this kingship of Christ, we find the initial restoration of the original kingship of man. The idea that Christ now rules the destinies of individuals and nations in the interest of his blood-bought church, is a far more comforting thought than the notion that he is now a refugee on the throne of heaven. 2. The relation of the regnum potentii to the regnum gratii. The kingship of Christ over the universe is subservient to his spiritual kingship. It is incumbent on Christ, as the anointed king, to establish the spiritual kingdom of God, to govern it, and to protect it against all hostile forces. He must do this in a world which is under the power of sin and is bent on thwarting all spiritual endeavors. If that world were beyond his control, it might easily frustrate all his efforts. Therefore God invested him with authority over it, so that he is able to control all powers and forces and movements in the world and can thus secure a safe footing for his people in the world, and protect his own against all the powers of darkness. These cannot defeat his purposes, but are even constrained to serve them. Under the beneficent rule of Christ even the wrath of man is made to praise God. 3. The duration of this kingship. Christ was formally invested with this kingship over the universe when he was exalted at the right hand of God. It was a promised reward of his labors, Psalms 2 verses 8 and 9, Matt, 28 colon 18, F. 1 colon 20 dash 22, Phil 2 colon 9 dash 11. This investiture was part of the exaltation of the God-man. It did not give him any power or authority which he did not already possess as the Son of God, neither did it increase his territory. But the God-man, the mediator, was now made the possessor of this authority and his human nature was made to share in the glory of this royal dominion. Moreover, the government of the world was now made subservient to the interests of the Church of Jesus Christ. And this kingship of Christ will last until the victory over the enemies is complete and even death has been abolished. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 24-28 At the consummation of all things the Godman will give up the authority conferred on him for a special purpose, since it will no more be needed. He will return his commission to God, that God may be all in all. The purpose is accomplished, mankind is redeemed, and thereby the original kingship of man is restored. Questions for further study, in whom was Christ typified as prophet in the Old Testament? How were the true prophets distinguished from the false? How did prophets and priests differ as teachers? What was characteristic of the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek? 
Were the sacrifices of Cain and Abel Piacula? On what grounds do Jowett, Maurice, Young, and Bushnell deny the vicarious and typico prophetical character of the Mosaic sacrifices? What is the difference between atonement, propitiation, reconciliation, and redemption? What accounts for the widespread aversion to the objective character of the atonement? What arguments are advanced to disprove the necessity of the atonement? Why is penal substitution practically impossible among men? Does the universal offer of salvation necessarily imply a universal atonement? What becomes of the doctrine of the atonement in modern liberal theology? What too? Paracletoi have we according to scripture, and how does their work differ? What is the nature of the intercessory work of Christ? Are our intercessory prayers like those of Christ? Is Christ ever called, King of the Jews? Do premillenarians deny only the present spiritual kingship of Christ or also his kingship over the universe? Literature, Bavink, Jeref. Dogm. 3, pp 394-455, 538-509. Kuiper, Dick Dogm, De Cristo, 3, pp 3-196, Vos, Jeref. Dogm. 3, pp 93-197. Hodge, Syst, Theol, 2, pp 455-609, Shed, Dogm. Theol, 2, pp 353-489, Dabney, Syst, and Polemic Theol pp 483-553, Dorna, SYST, of CHR Doct. 3, pp 381-429, 4, pp 1-154, Valentine, CHR Theol, 2, pp 96-185, Pope, CHR Theol, 2, pp 196-316, Calvin, Institutes, Book 2, Chaps. 15 to 17, Watson, Institutes 2, pp 265 to 496, Schmid, Doct. Theol of the E.V. Luth. Church, pp 344 to 382, Micklem, What is the Faith? pp 188 to 205, Bruner, The Mediator, pp 399 to 590, Stevenson, The Offices of Christ, Milligan. The Ascension and Heavenly Priesthood of Our Lord, Meter, The Heavenly High Priesthood of Christ, A. Cave, The Scriptural Doctrine of Sacrifice, Faber, The Origin of Expiatory Sacrifice, Davison, The Origin and Intent of Primitive Sacrifice, Symington, Atonement and Intercession, Stevens, The Christian Doctrine of Salvation, Franks, History. Of the Doctrine of the Work of Christ, 2 Volumes, D. Smith, The Atonement in the Light of History and the modern spirit, Macintosh, Historic Theories of the Atonement. MacLeod Campbell, The Nature of the Atonement, Bushnell, Vicarious Sacrifice, Denny, The Christian Doctrine of Reconciliation, Kuiper, That de Gene Particulier is, Boomer, Jean Algemeen Verzoening, De Jong, De Lier de Verzoening in de Americanche Theology, S. Cave, The Doctrine of the Work of Christ, Smeaton, Our Lord's Doctrine of the Atonement, Ibid, The Apostles' Doctrine of the Atonement, Cunningham, Historical Theology 2, pp 237-370, Creighton, Law and the Cross, Armour. Atonement and Law, Matthews, The Atonement and the Social Process, and Further Works on the Atonement by Martin, A. A. Hodge, Crawford, Dale, Dabney, Miley, Mosley, and Burkhoff.